Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lorenzo. I am the CEO of Creative Zone. Welcome to another Creative Zone webinar. And this time we've done this in collaboration with this uh, incredible uh, list of uh, speakers that we have with us. I'll make some short introductions and they're gonna be talking about who they are themselves during the session. But we have with us uh, Antonio Paraiso. Uh, he's a luxury marketing consultant based in Portugal, in Portugal. He's, he's got a wealth of experience in this industry of luxury and marketing itself. He's got some incredible stories to tell us. Um, Antonio, welcome to this session. And, Thank you, uh, my look, pleasure. We look forward to, to, to hearing uh, about you and your work. Cesar Val, he's, uh, he's the founder of Seval Consulting, a beauty and luxury expert as well. I met Cesar recently through some other interactions. He's actually a creative song client of ours. And we started brainstorming on a little work that we could do together. Cesar, it's, it's good to see you. My pleasure to be here. Thanks, Lorenzo, and all, all the team. And we have uh, Daniel Gomez Rojas, Chief Digital Officer of Al Malki Group, who is a very renowned Saudi group from Saudi Arabia that are involved in, in luxury as well, being uh, a key partner of retail uh, of many of the, the big luxury worldwide uh, brands. So Daniel, we look forward to engaging with you too as well. Thank you, thank you. I'm really happy to be with all of you here in this panel. Excellent. So maybe to get things started, Antonio, let me start with you. I mean, the world of luxury has gone, grown exponentially, I could say, over the last few years. I mean, depending on how we look at this, I'm sure uh, you've been involved in luxury for, for long, but people can see nowadays, especially people from Dubai, they've, they can see how luxury has become more apparent, we can say, in the last in the last five years, six years, 10 years, we can say, but I don't know if it's to do with the way that people have been earning money, you know, crypto on itself could be a, a bit of a reason why there's a lot of money flowing around nowadays from, 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 from people in general. But give us a bit of an introduction on the, the luxury industry. What is, what is it that you see has been a bit of the, the, the transformation that this industry has witnessed over the years? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Well, very briefly, the, the luxury brands used to be very small family owned uh, businesses, which have been founded and arisen from the passion and creativity of some entrepreneurs. Um, and it, they used to be very small businesses addressing the elites. And they have evolved over time. And by the end of the 80s, early 90s, social revolutions took place. Middle classes emerged in China, in the, well, in, in the US before, and then in, in Europe, and then later in China during the 90s, early 2000s. And also uh, some brands, because they have been founded by people with no uh, management and financial knowledge. They were designers, they were small entrepreneurs with a lot of creativity and, and very good taste. So some of the brands were, in, 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 were struggling. So another phenomena occurred, the creation of conglomerates. The, the Pinot Group, which now is called Caring, the LV, LVMH Group, uh, owned by Louis Vuitton, and so uh, then later Richmond. And so these big groups started buying brands and consolidating brands. And the emergence of middle classes and the, uh, the new era of luxury brands managed professionally by people who know about management and financial um, who are financial, financially literate, this boomed the business of luxury. And so in the, I would say in the last 20 years, we started listening a lot about luxury. We started seeing a lot about luxury and the middle classes, they are 
the ones who, I would say, who buy around 80% of luxury. The elites do not buy so much. It's the middle classes who really uh, uh, make the business moving. So basically that's uh, very briefly, that's uh, how this thing is evolving. Excellent. Maybe Cesar, I can continue with you. I mean, how do we categorize? What is luxury from not luxury products and services? How do we define a line between the two? That's a very good question and, and, and a lot of all of answers maybe. But for me to make it simple, I would say that mainly luxury is about creating desire. And, and, and all of the uh, managers of luxury brands, uh, they are aware of that. And if not, they have a problem. But this is, this is mainly what luxury is about. And I know, Lorenzo, you like watches. You like nice watches. So let me put an example of watches to try to transmit this idea about creating desire. I mean, Patek Philippe is one of the, well, the well-known, uh, is known as the, let's say, the, the Rolls Royce of the, of the watchmaking. And, and every year, these uh, high-end uh, luxury uh, watchmakers, they do a list about the product they are going to about to delist. And surprisingly, generally this year, Patek Philippe put in the list one of their classic icons, one of the most loved uh, uh, icons of the luxury uh, watch industry, which is the Nautilus. Nautilus, it was one of the watches, and for sure Antonio is aware about this story as well, that, uh, that creates this luxury concept using stainless steel. So it's a really classic that it was built first time 20, 45 years ago. So some of us can, can say, okay, some of our audience, it may it's not working as it used to work, it's not being sold. And the true reality is you, you try to buy one of these watches, even before the announcement, it takes years of waiting list to buy one of them. And uh, some of the models, I remember the black and the, and the blue uh, dial, it takes up to eight years of waiting list to buy one of these models. So it's being sold very well. And even though they decide to discontinue this brand. So for us to understand what is behind this movement, and, and one of the things that happened, it was very clear on pricing. The retail price of this watch is between, depending USA, Americas, Middle East, between $30,000 to $35,000 per piece. So it's a really high-end watch. You buy in the second hand, even before the amount, you find it for $60,000, $70,000. After the announcement, you cannot find it for less than $100,000, $150,000. So this, this way of creating a desire is about very small pieces in the market, ringing the availability to, to, to go to the, to the product. So in the end, what they are doing very smartly, very brave, but following a value creation, an ultimate value creation strategy is to create this boost out of the market. Now imagine that, that in one year time, two years time, they launch the new version of this masterpiece. For sure, the starting price point will be much more above than the initial of 35. They cancel it between the 60, 70, and the 200 that you can find the second market. Mm -hmm. So this is a very specific way that you cannot find in the luxury. I've been working for 10, 12 years in the luxury industry. Before that, I was in the fast moving consumer goods. And you cannot imagine one of these fast moving consumer goods companies mm -hmm. saying, okay, we're going to kill one of our best sellers. This is not happening <laughs> it's because the way you manage one, one and, and the other non-luxury, non-luxury is completely different. Both of them are creating value. Mm. I cannot say that Danone or any of the fast moving consumer companies are not creating value, but the way they create value is completely different. One is value creation, the other one is ultimate value creation. And this makes the difference between one category and the other. But I, I, I wonder then, and maybe I can pass on this, the, 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 the follow-up question to Daniel. I guess for, for a brand to be able to create that desire, that exclusivity feeling, there, need, there needs to be a certain uh, number of elements that that brand, that that company has to own. And things that come to my mind is, you know, years of heritage and, 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 and being in the industry for a long time. But then you have some people that come and disrupt the industry. So that what comes, since we're talking about watches, we have Richard Mill. Richard Mill is a newcomer. They have uh, uh, many less years in the industry than Patek Philippe and their watches are in the millions of dollars. So Daniel, how do you, you know, how do we comprehend or understand what is needed for you to create that exclusivity and what is being done by some people that are sort of changing the, the, the landscape on how this is usually done? Yes, uh, that's a great uh, question, Lorenzo. Actually, 
in the luxury industry, historically, it was all about heritage. What is the story behind the brand? How long have we been in the market? The product story behind. And this was the traditional marketing uh, way of uh, creating this desirability that Cesar mentioned. However, we live in a digital world and people want to consume content. And there are companies. One example is Moncler. Moncler is a brand that was selling $50 million when it was bought by, by Mr. Rufini. And now it's selling 1.2 billion. It's an explosive growth. So they managed to create this desirability. It's true that there was a small story to tell behind uh, Monastère de Clermont in the 20s, but they just managed to reach global audiences through very smart communication, mostly through social media, and also with, with a very uh, interesting product strategy with collaborations with, uh, with many, many designers. So yeah, it's not easy to build a brand. You need to invest a lot. Content is not cheap. And, in, and, and the storytelling that you want to build in, in fashion, in jewelry, in beauty, you have to create very, very good quality content. So it's always a long-term strategy. So <clears throat> all these brands, uh, they think long-term, they have a clear vision and they have a focus. Okay, we're going to work in the next two, three, four, five years, investing in creating amazing product, amazing content, then not really focus on, on profitability and even being loss making, but then at a later stage, they can, uh, they can make it happen. And that's uh, coming to, to what Antonio mentioned, big groups that are buying brands and they develop them with a long-term vision. One example is Rimova, Rimova, German, traditional, good quality brand. Yeah. But then when it was bought by LVMH, they totally changed the storytelling. And it's amazing what they're doing. They're having sportsmen, uh, people in the culture, uh, designers talking about the Rimova <laughs> lifestyle. And I, I'm sure I'm probably because LVMH, they don't disclose uh, uh, sales by brand and profitability. Probably this brand is not very profitable right now, but for sure with the LVMH strategy, they will reach profitability in a, in, in a couple of years, in a few years. So it's always a long-term strategy that requires yeah. a lot of investment. And um, if I may, Daniel and Remova is bringing digital innovation. You have an app now. You have an app now and you control the luggage through your app. If, 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 if you don't get the luggage in the destination airport, you, you can track it immediately. Mm. So uh, they're really focusing on the new generation. You, Daniel, said something, and I want to go back to you, Antonio, with a key marketing questions. I know that you're an expert on marketing, you're an advisor on marketing related topics, but there's a topic that left me hanging with Daniel. You commented a, a few things about growth and you explain kind of that there is a bit of a consolidation in, consolidation process happening. Is there a consolidation? Are uh, bigger groups buying smaller luxury companies? And the second point to that question is, are the luxury, big luxury brands growing in the last two, three years in terms of turnover? So, um there is a consolidation, especially the big groups. The big, they're gonna get bigger. LVMH is acquiring more brands. They're doing, making bold decisions. Some brands that are not working, they are changing the creative director and they try it again. They don't give up. Mm -hmm. So they have this long term issue. Karen is going to, <clears throat> to grow more. Richmond, our partner in Saudi Arabia, uh, they are betting uh, in fashion by uh, investing more in, in brands and creating new concepts. And they will be they will continue working in this direction. So the consolidation will be there. They will there is this discussion. Karen and Richmond will join forces. I don't think this is gonna happen. And I think the biggest question is what's going on in Italy. It, it, Italian brands, they have long heritage, product quality, storytelling. And we you see some movements from Italian conglomerates buying uh, some brands. There was a, a reason a, Purchases from Christian Louboutin mm -hmm. by, by uh, an, an Italian investment group that owns also Fiat. I don't remember the, the name right now. Um, and, um, and they're trying to, to do this, but I'm not really sure this is going to happen in, in Italy because all these, as Antonio mentioned, these are family owned uh, groups with strong heritage. Each uh, owner, they still have their vision. So to get all these, all these people aligned to build a big Italian uh, luxury group, 
is going to be very, very hard, but um, it, it's the only way to move forward in the future because these groups, they need to invest long-term. So by having a very strong group joining forces together, they can make long-term bets, even if it has a short-term impact in the, in the cash, the cash flow. Excellent. Excellent. So Antonio, I'd like to go back with you. As I was saying, you have a wealth of experience on marketing related issues. You started bringing up the issue of, of the diff different marketing channels. Nowadays, we can see how companies have gone digital. I think we're going to start talking about this. Tell us what, what should we know from a marketing point of view? How do these companies dis differentiate themselves? And how is it that they are able to communicate that that extra value that people are able to pay for, 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 a, for a brand or for a piece of, 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 or an item that is maybe 10 times, 100 times more expensive than, than other brands in the market? Well, very good question, but a complex one. Um, when, when I studied luxury brand management in Madrid about 15 years ago, digital was not an issue. Uh, I remember classes, the teachers would tell us, no, no, luxury will never go digital. Digital is for the masses. Luxury is about exclusivity and difficult access. But then again, uh, and the same for sustainability, luxury used to be about ostentation and wastefulness extravagance. And in the last 15 years, we've gone from wastefulness to sustainability, and we've gone from physical to digital, or digital, at least they say. And, and, and why? I mean, as far as I know, and as far as I've been reading and I've been studying, luxury does not follow trends. Luxury brands are trend setters, not trend followers. But they evolve, so they don't follow trends, I mean short-term trends. But they evolve as society evolves. And society in the last 15 years as a whole has evolved to digital and to sustainability. So luxury brands have been slowly, slowly adapting to this new reality of society. And um, digital in the beginning was used uh, in a very shy way just to promote and communicate the dream. But then we had this pandemics last year and all of a sudden there was no travel, no tourists, no, uh, no shopping. And digital was the only option. And uh, brands started selling on digital channels because there was the only option. And, um, and they finally realized it's not that bad. I've attended late last year a conference, the Financial Times uh, luxury conference I attend every year. And the CEO of Bulgari, stated there that they have increased last year their digital sales by e-commerce sales by about 40 percent and the ceo of cartier they he said the same that he's selling on digital like never before so now finally digital is becoming more important but then again, luxury is not all the same, and you have to differentiate. There are different levels of luxury. So uh, some luxury brands will go on selling on digital, and some others will not. It's a strategy choice. choice. So, but yes, luxury, digital is becoming more and more uh, of a thing in luxury. What, what percentage can we say, um, Antonio, is, it could be of one big luxury brand selling on digital or traditional channels? Do we have an idea? I, I don't have very accurate numbers on, on that. Um, but as far as I know, because digital use was not big 
So they're growing. When they say, when Bulgari says we are growing 40% on digital channels, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, but I would say that digital in, in some brands is, uh, represents now 30 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, because now in, the shops have been closed for one year, but I would say pre-pandemic levels 30 to 40 percent. It's mm -hmm. probably growing. Uh, the, 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 the last Bain, <clears throat> Bain company, it's a consulting company who specializes in, in luxury uh, surveys and market surveys. And luck, Bain's in their last uh, report, they said that by 2025, um, millennials and, 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 and Zen generate, and sorry, Z generation will, will account for about 50% of consumers. Wow. Yeah. And in five years time, in four or five years time. So I believe this will be growing. I believe this will be growing. But at the moment, I don't have accurate figures on digital, but I would say roughly 30 to 40% probably. It also depends very much whether we're talking about affordable luxury or inaccessible luxury, mm. because mm. there are different layers of luxury. There are not, it's not all the same. Cesar, what's your take on, on this digitalization and, and e-commerce that we've, we've seen, e-commerce explosion on luxury as well? What kind of products, what kind of industries are selling better through digitalization? Is it makeup brands? Is it luxury clothing? Is it shoes? Is it watches? Who are the, the big winners in this digitalization process? Yeah. First, to come to the point of uh, Antonio was very right. I, I think he make a, a very interesting point that it depends on the level of luxury that you are playing at. I mean, when you think about the really high end ultra luxury, it's a very low percentage where they are going. And, and when you are going to the affordable luxury, it's quite different. They're not much open. You can find them in, in, in multi brand uh, sites. So it's, it's a quite different depending also on how level of, of luxury. Having said that, I give you my perspective as well. I think that. Antonio was mentioning, Daniel and Sure will agree with us, but um, during the pandemic, it grows exponentially. The number I have from Bain, which is the same sort that Antonio was mentioning, is that it, it grows by 50% the, 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 during the pandemic. We're coming from a 12% and goes up to 23, 24% of the weight. But having said that, what I think is, as I agree with Antonio, this is something that has come to a stay, but I think in the long term, this will be a bit cap for all the ones that are the real true luxury. Because there is um, the more commoditized you are, the more commodity you are, it makes a lot of sense to be fully dedicated to have a dominant e-commerce site. Because in the end, e-commerce mainly is about availability of the product in terms of speed and price. And luxury this is not the language that luxury plays. So it depends, as Antonio was saying, where you are in the pyramid, it will be different. And to add another perspective, Lorenzo, may I, one of the things that for me has really dramatically changed, Antonio was talking about how the, 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 the luxury industry has evolved. And, and I think one of the things that has forced the evolve was the way that the, the luxury industry now is delivering the storytelling. And we're talking about what makes luxury different to non-luxury, mainly the storytelling. Storytelling at the end, you can make many definitions, but is what this brand is doing for me. So who is this brand and what this brand is doing for me? And the more and more, we have young generations coming. And young generations, they consider themselves like brands. They consider us personal brands. So it's very important for them what this luxury brand is adding to their own personal brand. So this is very important. And what digital has changed dramatically is the way you need to frame this storytelling. The storytelling before that, it was doing on, on press, on, on different channels. Today, 95%, 95% of purchase preferences are digital. So you need to frame in a different way your message because the decision of purchasing will come from digital. And for me, there are three points. You might make it very, very clear of how you need to frame the storytelling of the brand. The first one is you need to be very consistent because digital means you are everywhere, anytime. So you're not very consistent. Imagine how much noise will be around your message to your consumers. So very consistent. 
Second one for me is very precise. And what means with precise for me is you need to talk about your brand story, not the category story. I mean, today in luxury, talking about I'm the best in class is like saying nothing. So best in class, everybody could say that is best in class, but what do you are really, what is your really brand story behind, behind it? And the last one for me is being authentic. And this is something that especially digital has dramatically changed. Uh, being authentic for me is, I remember always when I go to London, this, this, when you go to the metro, mind the gap between the train and the platform, so mind the gap. And for me, it's minding the gap between who you are and who you say you are. What are you doing and what do you say that you are doing? So minding the gap between one thing and the other. In other words, between your storytelling and your story doing. Why? Because everybody's connected. Your core market, and Antonio was mentioning, 50% uh, of the market in 10 years' time will be the generation set today, which are 24 years old. They are already connected. So you need to be sure that you are authentic because they are very smart, they are all time connected, and they take their time to do the homework. So if you say you are green, be sure you are green. If you say that you are whatever, be sure you are whatever, because they will find out. So for me, these are the the, the digital generation, we, we train to fix it with e-commerce, which is a very important part. But for the most important part is how the digital transformation has touched, has changed all the touch point between the luxury brands and their consumers. Being consistent, being precise, being authentic more than ever. Because the digital revolution has put us in front of all of these, uh, all of these uh, consumers more than ever. So this is my point about, my thoughts about the digitalization. Very good points. Very good points. Thank you, Cesar, for that. Uh, at, at this point, I'd like to remind our attendees to feel free to start putting your questions here on the chat uh, section or the Q&A section. I'll be reading them. There is uh, one question already from One Vibes Nation. Um, it's Amanda. She's talking about some digital ro ro robotic vending machines. I'll address this, but I'd like to collect a few good questions. So please feel free to start putting your questions here. We, we got Jenny asking also from the Facebook page. We can see your question. Thank you, Jenny. Please send us your questions. There's another one that just came in here from Joyce. Um, Joyce wanted to mention something about the art, uh, about digitalization. Feel free, put your comments and we will read them here. So before I start reading questions, back to you, Daniel. I mean, you are um, Chief Digital Officer of Almalki Group. Ha how are things changing over there? I, I have a feeling being the typical traditional Saudi group, it was mostly based on retail, on the traditional retail stores in, in, in the shopping malls that we are familiar with here in the Middle East. Is, is the role of the retail store changing when it comes to the way that we buy and, and that we purchase things in the Middle East with your experience? And how is this transformation? I mean, you've been there as the chief a digital officer, it must represent that there is some transformation happening. So tell us a little bit, what's the role of the stores? How is this changing? Are we still going to see these big shopping malls with big stores? Or are we going to see more of display places where people are going to end up testing the products and then buying online? Yeah, well, I think uh, the role of the store in luxury will continue being extremely relevant. And even if we have markets like in China where uh, digital sales represent 30, 40, even 50% for certain brands. In other markets, <clears throat> it will take a longer period of time to reach those levels. And yeah, the store will continue to be <clears throat> a very important place for the brand building, for storytelling. So uh, luxury groups, they continue investing in stores that look like museums. They continue investing. And, and, and when we talk a lot about digital transformation, people talk about a lot about um, technology. But it's more than that, is how you build very effective and agile processes. So that's one of the things we're doing in our multi group. We're redefining our processes to make uh, the work more efficient. And we're also investing in our people, in, our, in, in the culture of the people in the company. Um, so the stores will continue having a key role. <clears throat> but now that we have digital touch points, which become very relevant, as Cesar mentioned, any purchase right now has a digital touch point in the decision-making process. That's why all the marketing budgets from big groups are moving more and more into digital channels because this is the first place where you get to discover the brand. Then as the journey continues, you will go to a website, 
and for very very high luxury you would never buy a or very seldom you you will buy a fifty thousand dollar watch in a, online the option is there but most of the people they will just read product information they will see amazing pictures the, creating this desirability then they would go to the store so the store is a place where many purchases will continue being uh, ended and, and converted, but also is a key place to capture customer data. And data is the key here, because uh, in the pre, in the pre-digital world, what well, what well, was about luxury? It was about personalized experiences. You would mm -hmm. come to your shop, and they would know your name. They would remember what you bought, and they would treat you one to one. But then, as you move into digital, then you're creating certain deep dispersonalization because uh, the, the digital tools at an initial point, they don't know uh, much about you. But by capturing proper data and by linking the transactions to the customer behavior to, and to the, the, the customer data, then we can drive really personalized experiences also in digital channels. So a customer would see product recommendations that are really relevant to them when this customer calls to customer service, they, the customer service team, they would know the whole journey of this customer when they watch the website, when they bought online, when they bought offline. So you can definitely build these one-to-one -one interactions even um, in digital channels. And during COVID, we saw that many, many companies as they wanted to continue buying, uh, selling, they became more flexible and they started engaging with the customers through WhatsApp. Who would say that uh, the, 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 the sales staff would be talking every day to the customers to WhatsApp? What is more personal to you than your mobile phone and your WhatsApp telephone? So it's it's clear that um, that companies and we in Almalki were building everything to engage with the customer at any channel. For for us, mm -hmm. it doesn't. We don't see any difference between digital and offline. It's the same. We live in a digital world in an omnichannel world where everything is connected. And that's what the customer expects. And that's why we're going to deliver to our customers. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. And it's true. I think I, I visited one of these watch stores here at the mall. Very, very luxury one. I, I just came out of curiosity to, to, to learn about the brand. And I wouldn't be able to afford that kind of watch. And, uh, and they, they took my details. And, and yeah, two days later, I received a very nice WhatsApp by the representative explaining me more about the product. Uh, sending me some brochures about it. It's so true how you're going more personable on, on, on the relationship. Antonio, there's a few really good questions I want to start raising to you. And please, to the attendees, please put your questions here. There's a few really good questions coming through. He says, can anyone throw some light on how culture impacts young consumers' luxury purchase decisions? Any big differences between the West and Asia? Are we seeing differences on the way the, the, the different cultures in the West, in Asia, in Africa, uh, and their purchase behavior? Oh, yes. Uh, culture is um, the essence of luxury. Ultimately, luxury is about culture. And it's about meaning. Pe people, people buy luxury because they want to feel special. And... Uh, and luxury brands relate very much to culture and meaning to add value, intangible value. Um, <clears throat> luxury is about the subtle blend of tangible value and intangible value. So tangible value is, is design, beauty, quality of materials, quality of manufacture. That's tangible. And then you add culture, you add uh, associations to art, you add meaning. And of course, there are cultural differences between countries and continents. Sometimes brands attempt, uh, they, they try to, uh, to connect and relate to customers and fans in different continents and they try to tackle their culture, but they do it in the wrong way. Recently, um, Dolce & Gabbana had problems in China. It's not the only brand. 
many brands have problems in China trying to tackle the uh, the culture, and so it's it's really you really have to be very careful when uh, dealing with uh, somebody else's culture. But it is true that you have if you want to relate to people and to add intangible value to the relationship and to the product and to the brand and to the concept, you really have to do associations with culture. Um, the, the, the best examples I can remember are from Mont Blanc and Vacheron Constantin. Vacheron Constantin recently, well, recently, a few years ago, they've launched a beautiful watch collection inspired in tribal masks of primitive art. It's about six or seven watches, each one with a mask of a certain tribe, be it the Aborigines in, in Australia or the Maasai tribe in Kenya. And these are pieces of seduction. These are not to see the time. If you want to see the time, you go to your mobile phone. These, these watches are beautiful pieces of seduction. They tell stories about the tribe and the culture. And it, it, it really develops a relationship with the, uh, the consumer. And Mont Blanc. They every year they launch beautiful pens inspired in the life and work of personalities in literature or in art or in science. And for instance, the uh, Shakespeare pen, they have in the clip, there is a very small skull in white gold with two diamonds in the eyes. And only sophisticated, cultivated people will understand that the skull has to do with Hamlet. Mm. And that's how you, and, and, and people will get goosebumps and people will have wet eyes and people will remember they have seen Hamlet in, in Broadway or the West End. And that's how you develop intangible value. And that's, why you pay 30 or $40,000 for a pen mm. because of the cultural value intrinsic in the product. Now, the difficult part is how to develop cultural value in mm. a product. Mm. Because really, if you don't do it well, you, you can mess up and have problems like Dolce & Gabbana recently did in China. Yeah. Now, another question related to this, Antonio, for you, you're talking about creating cultural value for a product. How about creating cultural value for a destination? You know, we have these destinations like France and Italy, Switzerland, that are linked and are related to the, to the consumer as top destinations where it actually comes from. Is there space for newcomers in, in luxury uh, uh, products, or are we going to be stuck with the usual four or five countries that are known for this? Um, that's a difficult question, a very good one, but a difficult one. Um, I, I believe we're, we're talking about the origin of luxury, and it, it, it dates back to the times, I mean, luxury in the, France is considered the motherland of luxury. Why? Because of the Sun King and his minister of state Colbert back in the, fifth, in the 14th, 15th century when they started uh, developing luxury in France as we know it today. And, and, and the French luxury is known as the sophisticated, timeless luxury. Then we have, in Britain, we have cars. We have Bentley and Rolls Royce. And in Switzerland, we have watches. And I mean, it's impossible. You cannot move these destinations. It's the origin of luxury. Um, but then again, what other destinations can do they can develop 
intangible value around the assets that they have and promote them. I mean, not every destination or not every product or brand can be luxury, but they can learn from luxury marketing techniques, adapt them and apply them to promote um, their destinations or their products. Um, Pre-pandemic in 2019, south, the region of South Italy called Puglia, which is the hill of the uh, boot, the region of Puglia, they famous decided- for oil. Famous for oil, yes. Yes. They, they, they decided to promote them, the region, uh, I mean, the authorities, they promoted the region as a luxury destination very authentic, um, nothing ostentatious, uh, very natural. And they started doing a set of um, activities to promote. They organized a big conference. They invited me as a speaker. I was there in September, late September. I did a speech, a talk about luxury, the fascination of luxury. It was beautiful. It gathered a hundred people a hundred professions from around the world and to promote the destination as a non-ostentatious, authentic destination. And then coincidence or not, out of this work of promotion of the authorities, two months later, the Dior house has chosen the capital of Puglia, Lecce, to be the stage for their most recent catwalk and fashion show presentation. And uh, they were talking about the cultural aspects of the region and the history of the region. And we were taken to different castles and palaces and monuments. And we were told about the traditions. And I, I'm, I'm feeling like coming back and I want to come back as soon as we can travel again for leisure. I want to go there and spend a week in one of the beautiful hotels they have there. So yes, you can, you can promote any destination as a, uh, uh, if not luxury destination, why don't you call, instead of luxury, why don't you call it excellence? Mm -hmm. Excellence destination. Good. It's a Good different stuff. way to put it. Indeed. Good stuff. Thank you, Antonio, for that. Cesar, I have a good question for you. Vera is asking, Vera El Khoury, investing with famous influencers and bloggers, is it worth it? What's wow. happening with social influencers? Is what it happening? Are the luxury brands using influencers? That's a very smart, difficult question to answer, Vera. And actually, I, I was watching also some questions down there. I think it was me Mary Men talking about the decision of Bottega Veneta and not doing social media. It's a good question, that one. We have seen lately in almost all the categories, but in luxury, it has happened very strongly, all of this boost on, on social media influencers. So first of all, one thing is social media. The other thing is the use of influencers and bloggers, which are completely different because you can manage by your own your social media net and, and, and you can also use the, the, the leverage of, of influencers. There is now an interesting debate about that, about this specific point. And my, my, my perspective, I think that more and more, and again, it's not the same the, the, when you talk about the high-end luxury and you talk about the more affordable luxury, that more and more, the big brands, especially the high-end brands, are going to, to work on, on, create, on, on, on content creation. And I think Daniel has mentioned that, which is quite different from using influencers. And pandemic, I think, is one of the things that has been affected this point. I mean, especially young generations, they want to listen about stories. They want to see contents. We are all time connected today. I mean, uh, today we are having this webinar, but it's not if Netflix, it's not this. And we want to listen to stories. And, and luxury brands are very aware about that. So when you compare this with an influencer just taking a picture in a beautiful beach, I mean, what is the added value of one side on another? How long can you go building your own content, creating your content 
that delegating this content on, on an infrastructure. So first of all, I think it will be a clean in on this. There are good infrastructure that they're doing the job. And secondly, what I think is going to boost is all the brands. I'll give you a couple of examples. One, for example, it was came from Dior. Dior, uh, I mean, the beauty and fragrance industry, and I love this industry. They, they made a film. So instead of looking for an influencer or doing the typical media, they made a film called Nose. And you can find this, this film in, I think it's in Amazon available or in, or in Apple TV. And they, they, they talk about the story of, of a perfumer doing all the journey in grass, which is the, the worldwide region for the perfumery, and all the storytelling behind building a nice perfumery. So this is something for me that is adding much beyond an influencer. So content creation, Gucci, the last campaign of Gucci, the Gucci Beloved. I mean, instead of using just teacher, just using influencers, they are, they are recreating a late night show and they are using uh, fun, they are using their own stuff, they are doing the show. So this is about content creation, it's not just using influencers. So I think this is gonna be the trend, more and more luxury brands doing their own content and using their own channels. The last point, in beauty is happening. Sometimes you put all your efforts in leveraging in, a, in an influencer and some influencers, they create their own brands. So you are leveraging on the influencers and the influencers, they go with their own brands. So what is the position for your brand? You have put all the efforts in, the very, in, in, in leveraging on this influencer. So this is shaking this every big time and I think we'll see a lot of things happening in this direction. I, I think I was, I was really, I was looking at this video a couple of days ago, there was this influencer who texted something about uh, Apple, Apple uh, products and Apple watches and uh, he's saying how amazing this Apple product is, but then the post says posted by and it showed that it was an Android phone. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, so I think we have to so be careful. We're talking, so we're talking what? about being genuine. So how genuine yes. you could look like a when you do this kind of thing, we say one of the main things for any brand, especially in luxury, you need to be genuine, you need yeah. to be authentic. So how sensitive you can find there. So th that's exactly my point. Yeah. That's exactly. It's dangerous. Yeah. I don't think don't use employees, but it's, a, it's something you need to manage very carefully. We have 10 minutes left. There's so many good questions coming through. So many questions. I want to yeah. shift, shift the conversation towards an aspect, which is how about entrepreneurship how about startups we have i'm sure in this panel we have about 90 people connected on the chat what can we tell people that are starting businesses in this luxury industry how does it work if you're a startup in this industry which way should you go are you for sure having to set up something that is digitally driven what tips can we give daniel what what could be some considerations that startups should be considering if they're launching something in this, in this space? Well, I think the essence of luxury at the end of the day is product quality. So what is, what differentiates you building the product? What is unique? What are the unique materials or uh, methods building the, the product? And then second step is how you communicate in a smart way, because when you're a startup, you don't have a lot of money to invest and content, as I mentioned, is quite expensive, but how can you tell the story in a smart way, but also in a very beautifully presented way? If you're not building beautiful content, then you are not luxury. So how can you tell the story about the, the materials, uh, the effort behind building that product? And then um, obviously to become really relevant and reach global masses, then as the startup grows, it's getting a a core a market then moving into international expansion is better to go strategically one market by market trying to go global it's very expensive it's very difficult and it would be, it will bear your resources so then pick your key markets everyone thinks about china but china is very difficult and very expensive but then if you're starting let's say uh, why not uh, a luxury comes starting from from the uae or from saudi arabia yeah, then pick your core markets nearby, then eventually expand into all the markets with less barriers of entry. And then when you have enough funding, enough capital, then uh, try to make it in China, uh, to, which is the main luxury market, but uh, the most difficult one. Excellent. Antonio, what tips yes. we can give to startups and entrepreneurs in terms of starting a luxury brand? Uh, well, first of all, 
this is the way I see it. If you want to start something, you shouldn't start a luxury brand. You should start a brand. It's not you, the entrepreneur, who decides whether this is luxury or not. It will be the market. It will be people, fans. They will tell you that whether you are luxury or not. You have never seen a luxury brand telling, I am luxury. We, as a market, we as consumers and fans, we tell that they are luxury. So if you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea, develop your idea with a lot of passion, with a lot of detail, put beauty in every single step of whatever you do. If there is something I have learned in the luxury master I did is that luxury brands put beauty in everything they do. Beauty is magnetic, beauty sells. So put beauty in everything you do, develop detail, be authentic, be passionate about what you do, develop beautiful products, high quality products as Daniel just mentioned and communicate them with passion, find the right um, customer audience for that type of product. And then the market, if they like it and will start selling, uh, buying it, the market will tell you whether you're luxury or not. And then as you go, you will understand where is your position in the market. But I, I I don't see someone saying, I don't believe in this. Hey, I'm going to create a luxury brand. No, you're going to create a brand. Whether this is luxury or not, time will tell and people will tell. It depends on what you do. Mm. That's my take. Good, good, good comments, Antonio. Thank you for that. Cesar, what's your take on tips for startups and entrepreneurs into this industry? Absolutely aligned with the, with the comments of Daniel and Antonio. Let, let me try to add something else. First of all, you need to, more than thinking about the product itself and, and whether it's luxury or not, think about your tribe. Think about your persona. So, so think about who is the person who is going to use this product. And then you need to think that more and more, we're talking about today, the, the, the young generation, I'm talking about the generation, I'm talking the, 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 the Z generation, the young millennials, these are your, your, most of your future customers. They are super value driven. So, so first of all, think about them. Think about how can you resolve their life? What can you do for them? And then try to connect with their values. If your values are connected with them, then you have your tribe, your product will work. And, and so, so my, my main delivery is don't think about the logo, think about the values. And today is a perfect momentum because more than ever, all of us, we are very concentrated on the basics, on what is essential and which is not, about the values, about the well-being. So if you find a solution, you have your solution, you believe on it with passion, and you find your tribe, then half of the job is done. You need to transmit it, and it's easier than never to engage because you have all of this social media working in your favor. So you will find your tribe, your tribe will try, it will, will find you. So no logos, concentrate on values, and then find your persona and talk about those values. And then, of course, you want to be luxury, quality, agree with Antonio and Daniel. But more and more, more and more, especially for the young generation and digital generation, values are not linked completely to, to the product quality. This is only one of the things. The most important thing is, what is going to do this brand for me to improve my life, to make it yes. better? Meaning. This is the process for me. And, and sorry, if I can finalize, yeah, yeah. and tons and tons, absolutely tons of intangible value as yeah. well. It's intangible? Intangible value. Value. Which it's brings us again, Antonio, to the belonging, to the culture, to the meaning. That, by the way, if you see these values, they are cross category. So it doesn't matter if you are talking as watch, you are talking a trip, yes. you are talking a destination. Belonging, cultural, and meaning are cross category. And this is something also different to the non luxury market. It's, it's yes. very value driven. And this for because me is the client is the same. Yeah. The same client who stays at the Ritz 
we'll buy a Porsche or a Ferrari, we'll buy a Patek Philippe and an Armani suit or a Zegna suit. It's the same person. So there. Because of that is cross category. Yeah, absolutely. We have three minutes left. I'm going to ask one last round of questions. You have one minute to reply on this one, each of you. Daniel, what's, <laughs> in, your, what's in your agenda for the months to come? What are your top priorities uh, with the work that you do? Yeah, so our top priority is to finalize our omnichannel transformation. So we just started uh, five months ago, but we're moving at the speed of life. We're going to connect online to offline, and we're going to have all these omnichannel journeys. People want to discover the products online, buy it in the store. They want to buy it online, return in store. They don't find the item in the store. We want to make it the customer able to uh, buy online. And obviously we'll have amazing, excellent customer service, both in the boutique and in our customer service team. Good stuff. Antonio, you started this conversation saying luxury, luxury is bought by the middle class. Now I want Mainly. to know what is it that the high class people buy? They buy um, unaffordable luxury. You cannot compare a Chanel lipstick with a 30 million yacht. Different luxuries. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, there is low point, uh, low price point luxury and high price point luxury. Low price point luxury is fashion, cosmetics, and the like. So they're, they're not driven by they're not driven by consuming brands. The high class, huh? Low low point price luxury is uh, mainly consumed by uh, the middle classes, the middle. mainly, and then high point high point, um, high price point luxury is consumed by the elites. Uh, I mean, cars, private jets and yachts, it's and real estate, it's a different luxury of a purse, a leather purse or a pair of shoes. Interesting. Different luxuries. Interesting. A final comments on what's your plans ahead, what you will be focusing on in the months to come? I'm a consultant. I have my small boutique consulting uh, company and the pandemic and I used to, I'm, I'm, I'm based in Portugal and I used to work mainly in, in Portugal, Spain, Italy. And then, and then the pandemic finally forced me to come to the conclusion that I have to digitize my business and that's what I'm doing. Uh, I've, I've studied in London, my English is good. So I'm going to digitize, I'm working on the digitization of my business so that in future I can do consulting jobs and training jobs and talks online uh, everywhere in the world. And for the time being, I have already a YouTube channel. So if I, I see so many questions here and I would love to address them I and mean, we have no time. so. Please, I'm telling everyone, connect with me on LinkedIn, bring your questions. I reply to all of them. I'm happy to debate ideas. And please visit my YouTube channel and watch my videos. Indeed, this is something I usually recommend towards the end. Please go out and reach out to these fine individuals, reach out to them on LinkedIn, write to them. I'm sure you're going to engage with them. And perhaps we could even include your email addresses. We're going to send the newsletter back to everybody that took part of this. We're going to send the full video as well. And we will include your details, gentlemen, if you're fine with that, so that people can connect with you. And then we can, co we can continue the conversation offline. Um, Cesar, from your side, what's, what's, what's next in the agenda for you? And a question. Talking about high high class people, uh, you know, uh, middle class. Is there something on on the way that they consume uh, the consumer behavior? Is for example, do they bargain when when it comes to purchasing luxury goods? Is is there something that they do different when it comes to the consumer behavior? High class individuals. Okay. Um... First of all, I mean, I mean, by default, if there is any, any brand doing pricing, doing discounting, promoting, it's not luxury. But by default, <laughs> by not part of, of the high-end luxury you are talking about. I mean, the moment you start discounting, 
is the moment you start killing some, I don't say the only one, but some of these assets that you are trying to build through the ultimate value creation. Mm -hmm. And actually, I tell you something, we're talking about the trend. Most of the brands we mentioned, LVMS, we mentioned Kerry Group, are all growing on the first semester and double digit growth on this first quarter. No one of them were discounting during the pandemic. So just to give you an idea about one of the one of the assets about that. And I know we are very tight in time. So I'm at your disposal and any of the audience I want to connect with me. I'm happy that you share the details. Uh, I will be super pleased. One of the things I, I love about my job is, is getting connections, getting uh, genuine network. So more than happy to connect and I will promise each of them, uh, I will be happy to connect with another. And for my plans, as you know, I, I built my own um, my own consultancy uh, during the pandemic. So for me, it has been that time of being able to try. It. But even though these kind of uh, setups help me to find uh, good customers in in Spain, in Italy, I'm helping some people also in India in this luxury journey. My aim is to help them to land and to expand their business in this beautiful Middle East. So this is why I'm going to dedicate the time to come, to concentrate, to, to help these uh, executive, high executive and, and companies to take the best from our golden Middle East in terms of we have a beautiful uh, country, a beautiful developed area, and we have a lot of things happening now. We have Expo, we have uh, Saudi opening up. So there's a lot of beautiful things. And I want to work as this bridge between these companies and this Middle East. And this is my plan for the future. Good stuff. All right, everybody, thank you so much. From our side at Creative Zone, we're here to help any startups and entrepreneurs in their journey of setting up their business. We, we have worked with a lot of brands that relate to luxury brands, fashion brands, beauty brands. So let us know if you need some help in setting up a company here in Dubai, in the Middle East. In fact, we're also helping people set up companies in Saudi Arabia recently. So reach out to us as well. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or through our uh, our website channels and, and, and other forms. Uh, Antonio, Daniel, Cesar, thank you so much for today. I personally truly enjoyed it. I think the attendees uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, thanks again for taking the time for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again thank in the you. next one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.